Being the first in the family to attend college presents one kind of pressure on students, but increasingly a wide variety of students are presenting symptoms of depression and anxiety, and worse, hopelessness. Last night, we looked at this concerning situation in the first of a two-part series around National Mental Health Month. Tonight, Jeffrey Brown returns to a school trying to address the problem. He talks to three young people at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology about their participation in the Portraits of Resilience project. I'm Emily Tang. Um, I'm finishing my junior year now. I'm studying electrical engineering and computer science with a minor in linguistics. My name is Victor Morales and I graduated in 2014. I studied mathematics. I'm looking for a job now as a teacher. My name is Haley Cope. I'm a senior here at MIT in Women and Gender Studies. They are three high achieving students at one of the world's most prestigious universities. They've also suffered crippling depression and been through years of therapy and medication. For Haley, who grew up in rural Pennsylvania, the problem started well before college. I thought it was kind of a normal thing. Oh, doesn't every middle schooler try to harm themselves? Um, no, they don't. <laughs> and so definitely middle school, high school is a very turbulent time, both in um, my family life and with the stress of applying to colleges, trying to you know, make myself perfect for that. Mm -hmm. um, for coming into MIT, my dream school. Make um, yourself perfect. Yes, sir. That's a big thing. It is. Yeah. Um, it's not something I can do alone. It's not something achievable. By the time I got to MIT, um, I failed every single class my freshman fall um, and had a problem with alcohol. By my freshman spring was when I realized um, after a when a, cl a classmate of mine in my dormitory committed suicide, I realized I should really be getting help again. Haley sought counseling on campus, and later, when she herself became suicidal, she spent time at McLean Hospital, a psychiatric facility outside Boston. Emily, too, points to early pressures growing up in Plano, Texas, including expectations within her family and stressful relationships with peers. I got through it, I kept going. And then once I got to college, um, I felt so tired, so out of it all the time. The depression really hit me hard again, and this time it was sort of worse than ever. It was really easy for me to just sort of slip through the cracks, for me to just sort of stop going to class, stop functioning, stop living my daily life. And that was when I went on leave from school. Victor says he always felt like an outsider as an immigrant from Mexico who was raised in Merced, California, and as someone who came to see himself as bisexual. By his sophomore year at MIT, he experienced debilitating anxiety, but says he didn't understand it was a form of mental illness. So I just blamed myself, and I slept What did through. you think was going on? I thought everybody gets stressed out and everybody freezes when they're stressed out. Mm -hmm. um, but I slept through an exam, and I didn't even feel like even emailing the professor because I felt so much shame, just had so much anxiety built up. I had this feeling like I didn't belong at MIT. You mean as in, in you're an imposter here? Yeah, uh, I'm not smart enough to be here. And it wasn't until months after I graduated, you know, I was starting to go through the symptoms of mental illnesses and depression and I realized I think I have depression. Did opening up to your family help or hurt, or what was that experience like? At first, it was hurtful. I come from a, you know, this kind of stereotypical Mexican family, and depression in our community is like an evil spirit. Emily, what happened when you told your family or people back home? I come from an Asian American household, obviously, and um, you know, in China, there's not. Mental health care is not a thing, you know, it's sort of like you, uh, you don't talk about it, you just get through it, it doesn't exist, right? It was really a struggle, I think, to really get my parents to understand um, what I was going through. But what about coming here, the pressure cooker of coming to a place where everybody's a high achiever? Oh, absolutely. Not to discount the, I don't know, perhaps utilitarian mind work of, uh, framework of MIT that kind of puts people's value based on how many hours you can spend in lab or how well you do on your classes. You feel it. You do. 
And you did get to a point at times where you thought of taking your life. Yes, sir. It got the worst at the end of my freshman spring semester, um, and I was hospitalized. Did either of you ever get to that point? Yes? Yeah. I didn't want to live life without the flavor. For Emily, things came to a head at home during her leave from MIT. I applied three times to return before I finally got accepted to, re to return. And, um, you know, they were sort of like, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you emailing this person? Why aren't you trying harder? I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. And I walked out of the house. It was like a, you know, body of water, like in the neighborhood. And I kind of walked to the edge of it. And I was just kind of sitting there. And I was thinking about, I was thinking about killing myself. I saw my parents' car, like, driving by. They were driving around the neighborhood looking for me. And um, after a couple hours, you know, a friend talked me down. The next day we talked about it. And... My dad kind of hit the point and he was like, you know, I really think Emily does care about this. It is her future after all. And I think that was kind of the turning point. That goes to a larger theme in the Portraits of Resilience project. In addition to therapy and medication, these students found critical support from friends and loved ones. I actually got really lucky in that respect. Um, I was in a living group. It's really small, really tight knit. And two upperclassmen had been through really similar experiences. And so I, sort of had their experiences to guide me. I had friends to walk me to my appointments. Through my depression, I built up kind of like a collection of techniques. Like, how do I overcome anxiety? Like, what do I do if I feel anxiety? Um, sometimes I would call a friend to get me out of bed. Anyone, even people who are not at a campus, uh, parents especially, can do something about this just by talking about it. All three are now eager to share what they've learned about themselves in the hope of helping others. I don't determine my beauty, my smartness, my success based on other people anymore. And that was one of those things that I deconstructed. And after that, it felt so natural to tell my story. These weaknesses that I used to think were weaknesses are now strengths of mine. In my community, I had these kind of conversations with people that went something along the lines of, if you're going to mental health and counseling, make sure that you don't say anything about suicide because they're going to commit you and then you're going to be forced to leave MIT and then you're never going to come back. And so I really wanted to address that kind of stigma. It's like saying, don't go to the doctor after your heart attack, MIT is going to kick you out. I started an antidepressant that I think is working finally. It's a process, but I think I get a little better at learning how to navigate my resources and uh, how, to, uh, how to get through the crisis with minimal damage and minimal uh, impact on my life. Victor, what are your plans for the future? There's so much I want to do. Uh, you know, I want to I wanna go back to grad school. Um, I care a lot about people from Latin America, um, but I also want to learn more in math. Uh, so I'm kind of like, which, which direction do I go? We'll see, you know, what ends up falling into place. I'm the president of my dorm and I have been for the last year. I will openly talk about what I'm going through. I will tell people about the resources available and I will offer myself. Haley has a coding job when she graduates and there's a happy new twist to her story. In her essay for Portraits of Resilience, she wrote of a new friend. In the story, I talk about meeting a friend in the psychiatric hospital. Uh, that friend became my best friend who became um, my boyfriend who became my fiance and in October will be my husband. Making that journey together has been a great and difficult and process full of grace and growth. Emily Tang, Victor Morales, Haley Cope, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. A follow-up now from a leading expert on depression and anxiety in young people. Alfie Breland Noble is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Georgetown University Medical Center. Welcome to you. Thank you. We've been watching an attempt to put a public face on this problem. So I want to, I want to first ask you, how much does the stigma remain? And how much are young people more willing to come forward and, and talk about it? So I think there's always going to be a stigma associated with mental illness. Um, it's just a part of what it means uh, for people who struggle with these illnesses. I think what I've noticed in recent years, five to ten years, uh, is that millennials and the young people coming right behind them are far more likely and willing to talk about these issues. I wouldn't say that it has completely eradicated the stigma, but absolutely young people who are in college and right behind them, high schoolers, are far more likely to share that these are things they're struggling with. How much do experts like yourself understand why 
this seeming rise in, in anxiety and depression and suicide. Why is that happening? One factor is that when you look at the young people we saw, you see racial diversity, which mm -hmm. I think is amazing and wonderful because these illnesses are so much more stigmatized in communities of color. I do think that um, people are more aware of what some of these issues are. They're aware of signs and symptoms. And what we find is that for African Americans and other communities of color, uh, people feel that they're exponentially stigmatized in addition to race, gender, sexual orientation or sexuality mm -hmm. by having a label of being diagnosed with a mental illness. And so we heard one young man say, the Latino brother, when he talked about uh, seeing these things and thinking it was normal, at some point during his college career, someone enlightened him and shared with him, these are signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety, which a light bulb was able to go off for mm -hmm. him. And in terms of factors behind it, uh, uh, do we know more about the, is it the genetics or the social behavior? We heard some of the references to social media Absolutely. playing a new role. Absolutely. So there's always going to be the hereditary factors and the chemical and biological factors. I think what's changed for some of our young people um, is social media. They are so much more inundated with all kinds of information, not all of it positive. Mm -hmm. um, the young people spoke about what it means to be constantly comparing yourself. Right. So you're always looking at report cards, so to speak, in different aspects of mm -hmm. life. And I think it can absolutely have a negative impact on our young people. How prepared or unprepared are schools today? So I think what I will say is for colleges and universities, they're trying, right? So they don't always have the bandwidth and the capacity to accommodate the sheer volume of students who are coming forward, uh, much more so now than even 20 years ago when I was in school. Um, I think that what colleges and universities are trying to do is find extenders, find other ways to provide support for young people so that everything is not funneling just through the counseling center. Um, and there are many opportunities that I think colleges and universities have found to do that, whether that's connecting with community members who can also provide care, um, connecting with different kinds of apps or other uh, electronic types of things to help our young people develop coping skills. So it's not necessarily full care per se, mm -hmm. but it is providing a stopgap measure so that in between visits or until a young person can get a visit with a person uh, in the counseling center, they have other ways that they can support themselves. So, so what kind of treatment is available to young people now? So what I always tell young people when I treat them is that there's the fast way, the slow way, and the best way. And I think when we think about fast and slow ways, medications, uh, psychotropic medications, mm -hmm. psychiatric medications are absolutely an option for people. I think along with that, it's important to think about the kinds of talk therapy that are available to people. And I always say that the best way is to try to do a combination of both to the extent that a young person and a family feel comfortable uh, with psychiatric medication. So uh, for talk therapy, we're thinking about things like cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, uh, teaching coping skills, mm -hmm. and support groups. And then we know what some of the different kinds of anti-anxiety and antidepressants are that are available to young people. So finally, what, what, what's the most important thing you want young people to know who, who perhaps are starting to experience anxiety and depression? And, what, and their parents, what should they know? I think for parents and young people, they should absolutely know that they are not alone, that uh, mental illness does not discriminate, it can impact anyone, um, and that there are people right around us, our loved ones, family members, community members, church members, other peers at school who are struggling with these issues. And so it's really important for them to know they're not alone, there's help. And I tell young people all the time, two things, take diets and breaks from social media, Take diets from social media. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Diets and take a break from social mm -hmm. media and reach out for help uh, to people you feel like you can trust. All right. Alfie Breland Noble of Georgetown University. Thank you very much. Thank you.